በአንሳታፊነት የሚንሸራሸርበት ቤት በሐሳብ ግብታችን ወቅታዊ ማህበራዊ ፖለቲካዊ እንዲሁም የህግ ጉዳዮች በስፋት በጥልቀትና በአካታችነት ይቀርባሉ የሳምንቱ ግዳም የሳምንቱ ለተጋባጅ ማህበረሰብ አንቀጾች ፖለቲከኞች እንዲሁም ሞያተኞች የሚቀርቡ በፕሮግራም ወቅታዊ ጉዳይ ታዋ ሀገራዊ ጉዳዮች የሚዳሰሱበት ዝግጅት የውይይትና የክርክር መድረክ ለተለያየ የጉራይ የሚገኙ ታላላቅ ፖለቲከኞች የማህበረሰብ አንቀጾች እንዲሁም ሞያተኞች በሐሳብ ዙሪያ ፊት ለፊት የሚወያዩበት ከዛ ማልፎ የሚሟገቱበት ፕሮግራም ህዝባዊ መድረክ ለተለያዩ ጉዳዮች ላይ ሁሉም የሐሳብ ገበታ ቤተሰቦች በቀጥታ ሐሳባቸውን የሚያቀርቡበትና ተሳታፊ የሚሆኑበት ቤተሰቦቻችን እድል የሚሰጥበት ጊዜ ነው። ለዚህና ሌሎች ሳምንታዊ ፕሮግራሞችን ለእናንተ እናቀርባለን። ይህንን እተወደደ ቻናል ሰብስክራይብ በማድረግ ቤተሰብ ይሁን በስፋት ተደራሽ ድሁም ለሌሎች ያጋሩ። ሐሳብ ገበታው እንዲጥራከር በተሻለ ጥራትና ስፋት እናንተ እንዲدرس በሐሳቦ በሞያውና በገንዘቦ ይደግፉን። ሐሳብ ገበታን በሱፐር ቻት በሱፐር ታንክስና በሱፐር ስቲከር አጋርነቱን ያሳዩ። በጎፈንድም ያማራጭ የሐሳብ ገበታን ያበረታቱ። ስለ ሐሳብ አስተያየት እንደሆነ ድጋፎም ናምሰግናለን። አላማችን የሐሳብ ማህበረሰብ መፍጠር ነው የሐሳብ ገበታ። ኦኬ ሄሎ ኤቭሪዋን ጉድ ሞርኒንግ ጉድ አፍተርኑን ጉድ ኢቭኒንግ ዌቨር ዩ አር ዚስ ኢዝ ኢትዮጵያ ቱዴይ a special podcast where we focus on the uh, issues uh, that pertain to the Ethiopian uh, contemporary Ethiopian political landscape uh, as well as the greater horn of Africa for today we have two guests on on the right we have uh, Mr Faisal Roble our um, he is not a guest anymore he is one of the founder of this podcast so it is an honor and a pleasure to have you back Mr Faisal and we have uh, dr adam he he was also one of the original um uh, guests of the uh, buffet of ideas a year ago and i'm very grateful that he is joining us on a very short notice so with that um without a further ado i'm going to jump into the, today's discussion and we have only one issue on the table that is uh, the state of diplomacy between ethiopia and the united states and this discussion is spurred by yesterday's congressional uh, hearing because it is very long so i use congressional hearing it is the senate of foreign affairs committee subcommittee on the horn of africa so it's very long uh, that's why i'm saying uh, just a hearing or congressional hearing if if you agree on that um let me start with dr adam today dr adam um what do you make sense of yesterday's hearing say where a uh, time of fire and the fury even between uh, between the senator and the Ethiopian ambassador not the Ethiopian ambassador but the um, special envoy Mike Hammer um i i would like to show uh, a video but since we don't have time i will just directly go to you and around the beginning the chairman of the committee also made an assessment of what is going on in Ethiopia including the political and economic uh, state Uh, do you agree with that assessment and do you think that um what you expected from the hearing uh, has been reflected generally what do you make sense of it and i will have specific questions after you make your opening remark and you have five minutes to 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 tell us your uh, uh observation adam yeah, uh, th- thank you very much uh, mogus um, thank you for honoring me and it's a pleasure to also join faisal um on on this on this program Um so you, you I think you uh, you touched on the key points um it was a very interesting conversation to say the least um and it was very revealing in terms of how the american government um was was it was all its diversity it's not a I, I, don't, i don't think there's a single perspective but uh, with all its diversity i think the, the conversation revealed what they think of this the situation in ethiopia is um and and how that analysis of the problems is informing their their policy their policy decisions uh, on 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 Ethiopia um perhaps a, a quick background i think it's very important to recognize three things so economically uh, ethiopia is extremely fr- fragile at the moment it's very very delicate um it's a combination of things um there are factors that are internal um but unfortunately also the external the international um situation also adds to uh, adds to the the, the bigger problems Uh, but the country is is struggling under significant inflation 
uh, shortage of forex, um, and extreme uh, international debt burden. Um, and if you've looked at the, the budget uh, for, for this year, um, the, the budget for debt repayment was almost twice as much as the budget and for education and health combined, right? Um, and now, fortunately, the Chinese government first, and now Western, uh, Western credit creditors have suspended payment. What that basically means is that uh, you will not pay it now, uh, but the interest and all will accumulate, which means when it, it has to be paid again, we would have to pay a lot unless something has been resolved at the time. So economically, very difficult situation. Politically, as you, can, as you, as you know, uh, it's also a very combustible situation and sec security-wise as well. Um, and what you see is, is that um, from the conversation, I, I had the sense that I think the American government is still stuck on, on the conflict uh, in, in, with the TPLF. In, you know, they, they're still stuck on that. Um, and, and their analysis and policy orientation seems to be driven mainly by that. Of course, um, you know, it, it's a, an important legacy for the American government in general and for my camera in particular. So they want to keep it. Um, but I think uh, the, the situation, the problems have shifted. Um, to the to what I think was the, the ultimate confrontation um, between uh, be, between be, between uh, be, between the, the Amhara uh, and an Oromos, um, and and I think so the, the the situation has shifted, but I think the American government's perspective and problem analysis hasn't. Um, and so I think that I, I thought that was that was interesting. And secondly, uh, you're right. I think they they're extremely worried about Ethiopia. Um, essentially pivoting towards Russia and China. There is extreme concern around that. Um, I think that was also reflected, especially when, when the chair was constantly pushing um, Mike Hammer and uh, the, the USAID representative to speak around what Abiy Ahmed may have learned from uh, you know, Russia's invasion of Ukraine and what that could mean, for instance, um, for, for the relations between, between Ethiopia and, and Eritrea, and that's and then the, the last, and I think was, in my opinion, was the most important one. One is that um, po the policy seems to be driven by extreme concern uh, that because of the economic, security, and political um, uh, situation that I described earlier, because of fear that uh, the country may collapse, um, and it's a very, very big country, obviously. Um, and, you know, even if uh, the Ethiopian government wants to let the country implode, uh, the West cannot afford to let it implode, right? Um, so in a way, uh, you know, the, 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 the worse you are as a government, the more leverage you have over the West, because it's like you are, you know, uh, you, you are a, um, a suicide bomber with hostages. Um, and and, and, and that, that is a, a country of 100 million people. And so they're extremely concerned. And so it seems to be that they are now moving towards a sense that, okay, we have to engage, we have to support it. Um, hopefully, I think they think that they can at least postpone the implosion uh, and within that time, then find a, a, a long-term solution. And so my thinking, and you may have seen what I said on Twitter, essentially was, okay, well, you know, uh, it might be a painkiller to support the government to prevent an implosion uh, is, is perhaps necessary, but only as a painkiller. We have to find uh, the solution to the bigger problems. And I think that bigger problem is a, is a political settlement countrywide, but particularly uh, between, between the Amharas uh, and, and, and the Oromos. Um, and until I think the, the, the West sees that, uh, also recognize its leverage. I think they, they should be more confident uh, that the Ethiopian government, uh, you know, whatever its theatrics, um, has absolute absolute need for the West. And no one else can 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 um, can inject the amount of economic capital, the amount of diplomatic capital, uh, the amount of political capital that the Ethiopia needs um, to 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 stave a potential collapse. Um, let me stop there. Uh, thank you very much. That was a very, very brief um, assessment. Yes, I read not only what you uh, uh, tweeted on X or Twitter, but I also read your long thread on Facebook where you have touched up on almost everything, I could say, on nation building, elite bargaining, um, dealing with the structural causes of the war and how to go uh, beyond the diplomatic expediency and bring about lasting peace.
So uh, I will come back to, we, to, to you with a couple of questions. But um, Mr. Faisal, um, what do you make uh, sense of yesterday's congressional uh, hearing, which lasted actually for more than an hour? I, I listened it to, to it twice, including today. Uh, let's let's hear from you, um, and then I will come back to with with Beth's question. Well, thank you, Mogus, <clears throat> and really equally honored to welcome my colleague Adam, whom I have participated uh, in another uh, conference in DC. Although he was virtual, but both of us were there, uh, organized by the Open Society Foundation, International Amnesty, and. Um, Refugee International, which was really very helpful. And I think now looking back at that discussion that both of us were participants is what has transpired at the congressional hearing uh, seems to be also applicable to this. And I will come to that issue later on. Uh, the topic that uh, Mogus, you picked up, uh, uh, which, uh, you know, Adam really covered in terms of the beef of the issues and the angles that uh, we had to look uh, from. I will just uh, make some commentaries since uh, the content is already touched as well as the fact that uh, we have listened to the, uh, to the tape and the hearing. If by diplomacy, which is the title, diplomacy between Ethiopia and US, uh, means managing the affairs between the two countries, i.e. US and Ethiopia's current regime, headed by Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed. The congressional hearing on November 30, 2023 was dark, macabre, and frightening. And I'm saying this after we have listened and the issues that my colleague touched. Uh, this was uh, participated by about six key members uh, who are uh, really interested in the Ethiopian and the African issue. Uh, they grilled, uh, for the lack of a better word, a special envoy ambassador Mike Hammer and assistant deputy Taylor. Uh, and I would like to say that I think Mike Hammer was uh, as diplomatic as it could come. He was really venice. Uh, cautious and uh, also very well uh, uh, careful to choose his words. Uh, John Johnson, who was uh, delivering the opening remarks, basically for the first time in hearings that we have been accustomed to, touched the true conversation that Ethiopians and their friends uh, talk at tea shops and bars at, at their uh, dinner table. He raised the issue of uh, bricks as uh, Adams touched why U.S. taxi bearers to the where you have hundreds and thousands of Ethiopians as taxi bearers and as voters on both local and national election continue to fund, uh, for the lack of a better word, an autocratic regime that is killing its people, had killed its people, an autocratic regime that is defying American democratic values and moving towards the BRICS with whom Ethiopia has no relationship whatsoever, except when they want to buy weapons to kill its own people. And I'm saying so this because the last time I checked the numbers, for instance, India, which is a major BRICS country, Ethiopia's uh, trade exchange is to the tune of several million dollars. It doesn't have any relationship economically with Brazil. And South Africa's trade with Ethiopia is minimal. The only country that Ethiopia has economic ties at this point in time in a significant way is China. And that is putting Ethiopia in the dark chambers of, uh, if you will, uh, debt, which uh, Adam talked. Uh, uh, as uh, he said, 30 billion loan is sitting on Ethiopia's duck and it cannot even finance the interest, let alone clearing the books uh, of, of this 30 billion. Uh, they, they talked about how uh, Ethiopia is on the verge of being collapsed if things don't go the right way. And this were very strong language to come from US congressional members who are in charge of approving or disapproving the budget that will later on be given to Ethiopia. So the hearing was putting Mike Hammer and the USID on the table and on the notice 
to show improvements to the extent possible. There were no significant improvements in terms of uh, the political uh, and peace conditions that both Mike and, uh, and Taylor would talk, except to say that things are improving. And the only area that they can show as if though things are improving were in the region of Tikrai, simply because, as Adam said, the Genza have been silenced and uh, people are not dying there, at least from from the Genza, but they are still dying from, from other things such as famine and, and lack of food, not to mention the psychological uh, issues that they are having uh, pertaining to the uh, to the rape and what have you. Uh, my impression was that I think uh, I've been watching and following U.S. hearings, uh, congressional hearings on Africa. This was the toughest hearing that I have seen. I think Ethiopia was put on the notice on several things. Number one, you cannot enjoy America's taxpayers' dollars while you are flirting with China and Russia. Number two, you cannot continue killing your people while America is financing you. And three, they questioned, like, what is the relationship that the United States of America has with the regime of Prime Minister Abi from the values that America usually, at least theoretically, and I'm not saying I'm endorsing one or another, but the way they talk uh, in this situation, the values that America cares about, which is to respect uh, democratic uh, ethos and democratic values. And they don't see any of that in, in Ethiopia. My impression was that Mike was prepared, but Mike was literally uh, cleaning the dirty spill is coming from Abiy. He was really trying uh, to to give and buy time to say we like to work with Abiy, but admitting that so far he has been having a tough situation. For instance, when he was asked about the war mongering rhetoric that Prime Minister Abiy raised in the issue of the sea, uh, Mike could not say anything except to say that yes, we heard that, but at the same time he seems to be working on his you know, on his word. So. The U.S. Congress members were really startled uh, by the words that came from Abiy to, to, to raise the spectrum of war. This was very bad for the Ethiopian regime. They talked about the war in Amara region. They talked about the Oromia region's war. And basically, they were saying, here we are talking about cessation of hostility in Tigray, which we have agreed, and this is a, <clears throat> a one year old, and a lot of things have not been implemented, but we have two other wars that he started. What kind of a person are you dealing with, Mr. Mike Hammer? And Mike Hammer should say nothing more than to say, I'm trying my best. This is what we got. This guy, I talked to him. Uh, and I think what I read between the lines was that, uh, yes, he's a tough guy. He's a very difficult guy to work with. But at this point in time, we don't have anything to, to say. I think with the... Uh, to say and change the, the course, except to improvement. That was the key word. We are looking for improvement, not really for major change. One last thing I like to mention was uh, the USAID. Uh, uh, he was basically giving you a procratic textbook uh, to all the answers. And you can glean that from what he, how he answered when he was asked the Ogaden uh, oil question, when he said, uh, they expect that all environmental uh, uh, quality assessment and sustainability would be adhered to. He was not aware of the fact that two years ago, the Ethiopian government literally said a study was carried and there are no environmental issues whatsoever. And to his dis my dismay, he didn't even read the article written by uh, a Somali young lady uh, from London who collaborated an article uh, with the, the Guardian, basically saying the Ethiopian government is denying the environmental issue. So he didn't even know that. He just gave a textbook and I will go back to the senator uh, who was really very active in asking that question and, and let her know that Ethiopian government is deny has already dismissed this, but the way he answered was wrong. Uh, with that, I think... Uh, uh, 
our people need to know that the question is that you have seen are only this, the tip of the iceberg. The entire report that each congressional member prepared will be put in the file and they will guide the second hearing if that happens. And what I gleaned from this was, this was the only hearing that I have seen for a while that all Ethiopian diaspora communities had one direction to pressure yeah. the government. Actually, that, that would be one of the areas where I, I we will focus on and I will come back to Great. you on, on that very issue. Let's Excellent. give a chance for Adam to... Um, and, uh, I will, Adam, I will ask you a couple of questions and then you will make a concluding, concluding remark and uh, uh, get back to your business, to your family, because I know you are so busy. Uh, but next time we will have you uh, on uh, <laughs> extended program. So my first question is that um, the, the chair, the chairman of the committee uh, said that um, as things stand now, um, he, he, they tilted towards perils rather than promise. That's what I said. Do you agree with that? Because he said... Uh, he actually said the only promising thing that we can see in Ethiopia is the, the GERD, the Great uh, Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. Other than that, all uh, things um, point toward this um, uh, state, a fragile situation. So that's one of my questions. The second one is um, you, 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 you alluded to um, the uh, uh, analogy of a suicide, uh, suicide bomb, uh, bomber where uh, the regime is taking hostage of the people uh, so that the international community might be somehow uh, lured into, into the regime's playbook. And what one of those things is that Abi have always been playing the fault lines between the Amara and the Zoromo. And I've heard it from a diplomatic source where he always mentions that if I am not there as a leader and the Zoromo and the Amara people will engage in a civil war an all-out civil war. So maybe that this can give you uh, a clue, at one of the fault lines that Abi is playing with. So that's my, my first question. And the second question is, um, on all honesty, and to be fair for, for, for the uh, congressional uh, members and all those submitted the report, possibly, did you hear all voices represented there? I mean, all the Ethiopian voices, the Amaras, the Oromos, the Tigrans, and others equally in an indivisible way. Did you hear that? And that is another concern. And finally, um, why do you think, and uh, Faisal, I will come to you as I promise, why do you think that the uh, different groups, well, ethnic groups or interest groups could not collaborate and come up with um, a unified position so far? I, I do not see even a uni unified position as such. Uh, why, what do you think and what needs to be done, Adam? These are uh, three interrelated okay. questions. Thank you. I'll actually start from the last question. Um, and obviously, the, the diaspora is, is part of the Ethiopian body politic, right? So it's not immune to the divisions and the conflicts and, and, and the narratives and all um, that happen within proper Ethiopia, right? Um, and so we should not be surprised. Um, of course, you know, considering that they live in a place where they have better freedom of expression, but where they have better opportunities, if they want to, to collaborate, find common ground, um, or at least create shared understanding about how they, they assess the problems, but also perhaps also in terms of how to move forward. I think in view of that, um, I agree there is a sort of, I think, a higher responsibility, considering the opportunities that the diaspora have, um, to, to try and move the needle a bit further, right? Um, and so in, in that regard, I think, you know, there is, there is more responsibility. But, but we should not uh, forget that the diaspora is part of the Ethiopian body politic. And so it, it's, it's subject to its pains, it's subject to its divisions, um, and it's, it's, it's subject to uh, all kinds of uh, manners with which the, the, Ethiop the Ethiopian public uh, operates. And so, um, you know, where all the, you know, could they have presented a, a unified position? Um, I think we haven't gotten there yet. Um, uh, we, sh we should get there. We should, that, that should be the objective. Um, but that requires, I think, uh, a focus on a couple of issues, right? I think everybody seems to focus on um, on the issues that, that they have different on. Uh, but in reality, they should be focusing on a context where they should be able to entertain those differences in a peaceful way. Uh, in, in short, they must be, I think they, they, they all must have, must agree 
that creating a democratic, inclusive framework in Ethiopia is in the interest of everyone. So all the issues that they raise can only be addressed if there is a democratic, inclusive dis dispensation. And I think they could put aside their differences on some issues and work towards creating that enabling environment. And I don't think we've, we've they've managed uh, to do that yet. Uh, so in short, um, yes, I think there, there was a sense of um, unity, perhaps more than before, uh, but we're very, very far from it. Um, so I'll, that's that's the first question. And the second one, uh, in terms maybe, of the, the maybe fault lines... Add, maybe if I could add, if I can jump on that and um, uh, just add one point. What 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 is the minimum, the least we could do in in, in this regard? I mean, the minimum agenda. Um, well, I think, as like I said, I think that they should unify on um, agreeing to push for a democratic uh, framework that respects fundamental rights, that respects the rights of the opposition to operate, um, and that push for a political settlement. Um, that, that can move us away from the, the authoritarianism, the, 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 the tradition of authoritarianism that, that seems to, to persist um, uh, despite, despite the hopes of, uh, of, of Ethiopians. I think that that is a minimum they can agree on and they can work on. Because I think that without that precondition, none of the issues that each, each group has will be resolved. It's impossible. So they have to agree on creating the conditions through which the issues that they have can be entertained, can be moved and addressed. I think that, that is, I think, a minimum that they could, they could agree on. Um, and that, of course, requires a shift away from uh, emphasis on policy differences, because you can have policy differences, but if there is, if there is no democratic framework, that cannot be addressed. You can't, you can't promote it. It's as simple as that. And so I think it's not just the diaspora, by the way. I think, you know, um, business people, religious institutions in Ethiopia, Everybody should kind of, if possible, come around, coalesce around promoting a democratic system based on rule of law. That that should be the minimum, I think, that everybody should uh, should 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 be should be willing to align with. Um, on the on the fault lines, I mean, you know, um, politics is partly about how strong you are, but it's also how you play um, your supposed supposed um, um, rivals, um, ad adversaries. Um, and to, to that extent, um, you know, uh, Abi, I would not, I'm not surprised that Abi or any other politician um, would would be willing to to exploit some of these um, uh, these these uh, recurrent divisions. Uh, you know, effectively, that's also the politics of the TPLF. Uh, now we we just see that it's it's uh, Abi that that seems to be at the center of all, all, all at the center of it all. But the TPLF played that game for for a very long time as well. Um, but for me, in terms of um, uh, in, in terms of when, when I was talking about uh, Ethiopia being so important and, and therefore making uh, Abi or any government important, I think there's a tendency to think that our government, our prime minister is important. Uh, but it's actually the fact that Ethiopia is important that makes whoever is on top important. We tend to forget that. Um, and so if Abi goes places, it's because Ethiopia is important, not because he is important. Um, we, we often tend to forget that. And, and because it's important, it cannot be allowed to implode, right? And so anybody who is in charge of the country has that leverage. And that, that's what I was trying to say. Um, and and, and um, what I was, I'm also trying to say is that the West has significant leverage as well. And so they, they are, of course, concerned about a potential collapse um, but rather than going for a painkiller, for basically e going for the easy way of supporting the status quo, what they should insist on is, is, is being more confident uh, in their capacities and the leverage that they have and insisting on creating those conditions. It's essentially what I said the diaspora should want, uh, the Americans should want as well. Um, and of course, that means you know, it will create, uh, uh, it will put them on a collision course with some core. Um, groups that are now holding the country, um, you know, leading, leading the country. But at the same time, there is a significant group of people, including within the government, I think, uh, that would be more willing uh, to entertain uh, uh, support for a political settlement, a genuine political settlement um, that everybody can, can, can live with. Um, and so to, to that extent, um, you know, the leadership in Ethiopia may have leverage because they lead the country, but the West has as much leverage uh, because the Ethiopian government cannot do much. 
without 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 the, the support. Um, I'm not sure about the third question. Um, I, it may have slipped. Because it was a, the, the, the third. The third question, which is the first, actually, is um, the the chairman uh, said that um, all the uh, factors on the ground, evidence, point towards the uh, the peril rather than promise. He said the only the only positive thing that we can see in Ethiopia is the Great Ethiopia Renaissance Dam in recent years. So, do you agree with that assessment? Well, I mean, um, I think, uh, unfortunately, I, I have to agree with it. Um, I am, uh, uh, you know, I, I am by almost by nature um, tilted towards being optimistic. Uh, but optimism is not like hope. You know, hope is hope. Optimism requires some justification. Uh, you can't just be an optimist, right? Um, and if you look at how things have been, um, I had an interesting discussion with a minister, an Ethiopian minister, a, a couple of months ago. And I told him um, that I was, I had a lot of hope in the midst of the war between the federal government um, and, 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 and the Grian forces. I had more hope than I have of now. Um, and he was, he was flabbergasted. Um, but I, I really, I genuinely thought so because uh, in that war, it was an easy war in that sense because if there was, there was willingness, it could be sorted. They just need to recognize each other. That's all they needed, right? But the conflicts uh, that we see now in Romia and in Amhara are more fundamental. Um, and, and, you know, even if there is willingness, they're very, very hard to address. Um, and the tendency, and, and, and that's, I think, what is very important, the tendency uh, in U.S. policy seems to try and find a way to co-opt uh, the armed groups in Romia and in Amhara. But the fundamental issues are actually in the center, uh, within the uh, Prosperity Party itself, and generally between between the relations among groups, particularly Amharas, Amharas and Oromos, and and that's why um, they should not just push for you know some kind of cooptation of these armed groups, but a genuine political settlement uh, that, in my opinion, at least in the short term, should include some kind of uh, rotation, circulation of power um, at, in 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 the center, um, and, and I think that, that will um, provide some kind of confidence. Uh, for everybody, that it would be the system will not only be democratic but also inclusive, uh, also at, at a symbolic level. And so, uh, just to, to quickly wrap wrap up, uh, yes, um, the, the country, and unfortunately, you know, th there is a tendency to think that things cannot get worse, right? There is a tendency to think that we have hit the nadir, uh, but I think time and again, but especially in the last six years, we have seen that things can get worse. They can always get worse. So we, there is no such thing as a nadir in a context of a political crisis of the scale that Ethiopia is suffering. That's, I think, very important. So there's a lot of peril, a lot of danger. Uh, and, and I think the, the American government uh, should, should avoid that short-termism that often characterizes their thinking uh, and, and, and a reflex to, to, to go for the easy way of working with, with government, stabilizing uh, the, the patient, but not, uh, not, 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 not solving uh, the, the the problem, um, of course, stabilizing the government is critical because you know if you don't stabilize it, it's very it's very difficult to do anything. Uh, but it should only be as a painkiller, and then uh, to find the, the the solutions that are fundamental. So I think yes, there is there is peril, mm. and yes, the Americans uh, can and must uh, must must recognize their powers and and push the government towards 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 the, the better side. But otherwise, I think um, they you know they may postpone the collapse, uh, but I am afraid, and this is very important, um, and you know, the, the problem in Tigray was, was, was a big problem, um, but compared to what is brewing now, um, I, I think it's, 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 it's a lot less serious, uh, in, in my opinion, and, um, and they are still stuck on that. Um, you know, as, as important as that is, um, the problems have, have morphed into something even more monstrous. And I hope they understand that uh, and they will not just focus on stabilizing uh, the, the situation, but actually addressing mm. it. And addressing it requires political settlement in the core of it, uh, including within, within, within the ruling party. Um, uh, yeah, I must Adam, unfortunately leave here, yeah, you have, you have, uh, you have but have I leave you in good hands uh, with Faisal. Yeah, I know. yeah, just, yeah. just one minute. So maybe um, we, we go to, uh, to, to Mr. Faisal and I will ask you a question. Maybe you can also reflect on what Adam... Uh, the points that I must made, you might have similar or different assessment of the same issue or question. 
But Adam, I will not let you go without reflecting 30 seconds why you said that the West regard Ola and the Fano as groups with little pop and reputation. Well, two what prompted one, you to say so? One, I mean, one, historically, unfortunately, the OLA, the OLF, um, you know, they, they have, you know, they, their ideas have, today they have kind of won uh, in, in a lot of, you know, a lot of aspects. But as an organized force, unfortunately, they have, they have, um, um, you know, they haven't managed to, 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 to show a level of strength and cohesiveness and, and structure uh, that other forces have shown. Um, FAN as well, I mean, it's still a very, very uh, nascent force. Um, uh, but unfortunately, I think, and, and, and this, is, this is what I was trying to say, they are like the bad boys, right? Afano has a massive reputational damage with what happened in World Guide West and Tigray for, for good reasons, uh, because of the violence and the, the, uh, the, the displacement and all that happened there. They have a, reputa a bad reputation. And the OLF, as you know, you know uh, uh, it often denies the accusations, but we know uh, that it is at least complicit uh, in, in some of the, the recurrent gruesome massacres that have, that have been happening in Orovia, including very, very recently in, in RC and, and Wolega. Um, and so, you know, these are not forces that the West, for now at least, takes very seriously. And so they, they see them as bad boys that, that may be co-opted. And the point I'm trying to make is, is that, uh, you know, the, uh, FANU, OLF and, and, and FANO are the symptoms of a fundamental problem, which is a lack of political settlement, uh, including uh, that political settlement, including within you know Amhara people itself, they may not say it and all, uh, but there is a tremendous fear that at the moment there will be uh, permanent juniors, right? Just like they were under the TPLF, and that fear, even if it has not been expressly said within the, the Prosperity Party itself, it's a fundamental one. And according, you know, I understand that there was actually an initial discussion at the start of the formation of Prosperity Party, but that was shelved, and then you know. Uh, you know what happened with the uh, with the contestation with the TPLF and then the war and all the emergency and all that has been shoved. But but I understand uh, that uh, that 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 is a, a massive massive issue uh, that I think matters not just for Amharas but for all groups. Um, and so even if the the current um, and I think it's very very likely that the current ethnic based system will continue, you still need a, a system for um, for 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 governing the center. And, and that, I think, requires circulation. Without circulation, uh, the legitimacy of whoever is there will, 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 will be contested. And I think what the Nigerians did uh, in, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, it's not formal, but it's, it's a consistently respected convention, both in terms of region and religion, they have managed uh, to, to create that balance. And, I, and unless Ethiopia creates the same thing, um, if there's only one group that consistently leads the center, um, that would not only be seen as illegitimate, but I think it can also affect the quality uh, of evolution that the political process uh, requires. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Adam. And I, I, I would have loved um, both of you to stay and even Mr. Faisal to ask you a question and uh, interject. But in your absence, he's going to uh, interject on the points you have made. And hopefully thank I will you. see you in the future and have a good night. And um, thank, thank you very much for, for, for thank doing you again. Us. And again, I leave you in good hands. Uh, pleasure okay. to see you again, Faisal. All right. Thank you, Adam. Take, take care. All right. Um, I'm sorry uh, to, to keep you for 20 or 15 no, minutes uh, for, that's for fine. understandable yeah. reason. He had to go. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so um, you, you have heard from Adam already, has made some, some assertions and points, and um, he's so. So pessimistic, as he admitted, as um, he is usually he's a very optimistic guy, as, as he said. But in any case, um, do, do you want to just interject or uh, I will ask you a question? I think it's better for you to interject on the point that he, he raised. And then if I have specific questions, I will come back. That's a better. Yeah. Well, I think uh, I think. Uh, it looks like Adam wants more role for the United States of America. Uh, but knowing American politics, I think what is a priority for the United States of America is not a priority or are not priorities for the people of Ethiopia. At this particular time, what is a priority for, for the United States is to ensure that the regime shows some reform, but continue. 
continue with all its imperfections. Um, even, uh, you know, in the hearing that uh, I haven't mentioned, which I thought I could, is the issue of transitional justice. Ethiopians are requesting a more genuine, inclusive, and uh, tangible transitional justice framed and designed by the people where all the gurubis that have been impacted participate. What the United States is uh, talking about is working with the government on the already proposed and uh, pos you know organized uh, national dialogue. Uh, the white paper that uh, Mike Hammer mentioned in his presentation is probably, you know, and I know some of us have seen the draft. It's just an expansion of the national dialogue, which the government hand depicted its members and people of Ethiopia, particularly activists and uh, political gurubis, have already boycotted. So over there, you can see that the United States of America could not really push the envelope to where the Ethiopian masses wanted. So basically they are settling for a couple of things, Mogus. One, I think uh, Adam mentioned the collapse of uh, the Ethiopian state under Abi Ahmed uh, interests America for different reasons than it would interest you and me. It interests the United States and the Western from the point of migration. Robert Kaplan, who was a very well-known journalist later on, found uh, himself uh, at the John F. Kennedy School of uh, Economics and, and, and Public Policy, wrote an article in 1996 on the Atlantic magazine, where the cover of the article of the magazine was blacks and Africans jumping over the fence of European neighborhoods and families who were barbecuing, basically saying, Africa is breaking the fences coming to us. Actually, before it happened with Africa, that happened with the Middle East. So the fear that all these black people will break the fences and jump the, you know, the fence and come over is, is the main fear that America sees. So it's a population control, not really so much. You know, the second one is if Ethiopia's state collapses, the entire regional area where America's interests, including as far as Kenya and Tanzania, can be destabilized. And that is where Adams was saying, this is a hostage kind of thing. So for both issues, America sees its narrow interest. For us, yes, those are issues, but the priority for us is how can we stop this nightmare headed by an autocratic regime who already killed one million, caused the country literally to disintegrate, not only collapse, but completely disintegrate. And how can we move? And I don't think the US government at this particular point wants to worry about that. They want to, they want to stop the bleeding stop so that they can work with the, with the current regime, even including if the transitional justice that we are getting from this massive mayhem is just a window dressing kind of thing. And that's why there is an ambassador already designated in the State Department that Ambassador Hammer was talking about, who will be working with the Ethiopian government, who already read her paper at that conference that Adams and I were, which I really came very critical on it because it was saying we don't have anything else but to work with the government. That's not what the Ethiopians are talking about. The Ethiopians are talking about a significant change, whereas Washington is talking about working with the current government with some reforms. So um, is that, that's is, great, is that this article? Yeah. Hmm. That's very interesting uh, uh, point, Faisal. Uh, so let, let me add something. So how could we align our long-term interest as, as Ethiopians um, with that of the America's uh, foreign policy, which is usually short-termism, as you said, or at times myopic. Um, so that's what, one question, because if there is misalignment of interest, we, we won't be get, getting any more in terms of diplomatic support that we seek from the United States. And this boils down actually to one issue for me, the post abi system or regime. Are they thinking post abi or is it only um, some of us Ethiopians in the diaspora always thinking that way? Yeah. So I will answer that and I will go to, as soon as you asked me to go 
if need be to add a Mrs. Comer. In terms of the the Ethiopian diaspora this time having uh, a quasi common agenda, they may not have come 100% together, but from the hearing you can glean that there was no uh, anybody advocating in that hearing or any group for the regime. They, they may have developed their questions and contacts with the congressional members and lobbied with them. But what you could see from there was entirely the entire membership who were, you know, examining uh, Mr. Hammer and Taylor uh, were, you know, having questions developed probably with the consultation of the Ethiopian diaspora. And they all had one direction this time unlike in the past, if you recall. So that is really the biggest development. I think what they can do in the coming two years, it would be very critical, particularly between now and November. It is a very critical period for the diaspora. They are American citizens, they are taxpayers, they vote. They vote at the congressional level as well as at the presidential level. I think if any indication, the hearing that we have seen, uh, there is an alignment between some of the interests that Ethiopians want and what the Congress members that we have seen would like to articulate. So I think between now and next November, the Ethiopian diaspora need to develop a common agenda to show the results. So you, you are referring, you are referring basically until next election, right? Until next election, because after the election, Whoever, if the Democratic Party comes, they have a four year that they don't have to worry. Uh, it would be, you know, the president would not seek a second term if Biden comes back and all this team will come back and they will be extremely satisfied and they will be doing what they call in American politics a legacy chapter. What, and, and most of that prom, probably will focus on internal issues to just rubber stamp their legacy. If a Republican comes to the White House, it would be a complete overhaul and revisit. We cannot predict it because we don't know who's coming. It may be somebody in the Republican Party who may not even be interested in the African issue, as one of the congressional members said, the last speaker in her, uh, in her questioning. So this one year is very critical two or three or four uh, more hearings should be conducted and Ethiopians need to lobby. It was a great start, uh, what we have seen yesterday. I think there has to be more for lobbying and putting on uh, Prime Minister Abiy on, on the spot. And they have to get some concessions. Concessions in the sense that, A, if there is no substantive change, at least in, in intent, then the the IMF and the World Bank loan adjustment will stop. Uh, Agawa will not be renewed, and other measures could be placed on the on the on the government. And the government will start bleeding in that time within a short period. If that is placed, then the new administration, whoever they are, will keep that for a while. They, even if the Republican is come, it will take a while before they scrap because that will not be on the burning. Uh, you know plate for them. It will be on the back burner and Ethiopians can take advantage of that. Yeah, just, just, yeah, thank you very much. That, 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 that would have been one of my questions, but you have already uh, touched up on it. Uh, but do you think in yesterday's congressional hearing, um, as, in, as inclusive as it appears, at least they uh, touched up on, or as, 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 as you made on your uh, as opening statement, they virtually touched up on everything ranging from politics and, and societal issues and economic relations and even militarization and um, the BRICS um, and, and all, all, all those pivoting. Mogus, if you but look at the- besides that, do you yeah. think that yesterday, yeah, but do, do you think that all pertinent voices, I, I would like to stress pertinent, not every, all relevant voices were represented in yesterday's hearing, do you think? That was well, the case. Yeah, I I don't. I well, it, the the big the big uh, blocks of the Ethiopian politics were represented. If I read between the lines of the question, is I think the Tigray community was was very well represented. The Amara was represented, uh, and the Oromo was represented, and Somalis were represented. From the question is, 
and from where those questions came from. They came from San Diego, they came from John Johnson, they came from Sherman, California, who has very good relationship with the Tigrayan diaspora and has been there for them all along. I think balance could be questioned, but I think uh, what I gleaned from that and going to Washington DC several times in the last three months, uh, most of the major groups were represented. And one attractive issue that people didn't catch that I did quote was also the, uh, the San Diego uh, uh, Congresswoman mentioned corruptions at the local level, but I would expect the report that she will place into the file. We'll talk about not only economic corruption, but the con political corruption that exists particularly in Oromia, in Amara, and in the Somali region as how this political groups and leaders reflect what's happening in Addis Ababa. That would be what they will submit to the, to the file. So I think not equitably represented because as I said some days ago on my own Twitter advising the Oromo brothers and sisters to organize more, it's how much you are organized and how much visitations you make to Washington and to your Congress and what have you, and then develop that relationship. But this time, what was very important to me, Mogus, was uh, the schism was less and the vision to, to pressure the Addis Ababa government was the unifying factor. Later on, they may have contentious issues. For instance, the issue of Al-Qaeda, I can understand that's contentious between the Amara contingency and the Tigray contingency, and uh, that may divide. But overall, when we talk globally, the, the, the question is told me that people's vision were at this time united around the pr pressuring Addis Ababa. That, that, that's great. And um, again, you have um, preempted my question where we had a fire and a fury between um, the, the uh, uh, um, Ambassador Mike Hammer and the, uh, the, 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 the congressman, uh, where they were debating basically uh, back and forth on the issue of Western Tigray, ethnic cleansing, and domestic issues, basically. And those domestic issues which should be settled uh, among the um, Tigray and Amara elites at, at, at best, and um, with the Ethiopian regime, um, if that is possible, at worst. So um, I, I don't want to delve on that issue, but if, if you have anything left that you need to reflect on the Adams position, go ahead and then if you have a final question, we'll come back. Yeah, no, I think, uh, I think this was, as I said earlier, this was a very dark uh, hearing for foreign relations because the US Cong Congress members are known to be to push back to pull back when they are uh, interrogating uh, diplomats is uh, working on issues like this but it just this reminded me of the south african you know anti south african apartheid days when some congressmen and women came for their principles and really grilled the state department and said we want change i think from Johnson to, you know, Jacobs from Washington to Sherman to even Colorado, uh, this Congress members, and if you really look at it, most of them were people of color uh, who care about Ethiopia, who care about Africa. The statement, one uh, phrase that uh, Johnson used was, you know, monkeying around the Ethiopian issue. He was basically saying, don't tell us all this bureaucratic language that says we are helping these dark black people. He was questioning really the intent and the sincerity of the diplomats because what he sees, what he hears from his constituency, what he reads, everything was dark, as he said, and macabre, as I said. And he didn't hear that from, from the diplomats. And he, you know, he gave them the credit to be diplomatic, but he wanted several punchlines. He mentioned the United Arab Emirates, you know, using its, here is an Arab small, two million country bullying 120 million Africans practically on the brink of destroying one of the oldest and most recognizable African countries. So when you are an African-American, that really hurts you in the heart. And that's where Johnson was coming from. This may not be the last public hearing, 
that will grill the State Department or the Ethiopia issue. This may be the beginning, and that's why I'm focusing more on the Ethiopian diaspora to really be serious, organized, as you said, put some of the internal issue on the side and talk about that in their chambers, but bring it to the forefront when they are talking to the congressional you know, uh, members to really see the big picture for Ethiopia. And I think that has started. I hope that continues. Okay, that's great. Now that, that brings us to towards the end of our discussion. I have only one question, and then you will make the final remark, and we um, hopefully stick to our, our, our one hour slot um, as much as possible today. Um, one of my questions is that, um, as you have said time and again, even a, a month ago when we started the Ethiopia Today show, I have asked you one question. And still, that is uh, pervading our discussion, and uh, it bears repeating again. And which is uh, which? Which is that the way this, the diaspora community is organizing or approaching the American uh, political system is that I think they are not informed by the American foreign policy as well as the domestic constituency. And what I saw from uh, yesterday's hearing each and every congressman or woman were talking to their constituency at the same time as they were making a case for the US government and the Ethiopian people. So um, the way we demonstrate, the way we um, make our cases and um, showing solidarity, demanding some pressure, inconsistency, especially from the pro-unity and um, Amara uh, diaspora, is worrying. There is a significant progress. I agree with you. But generally, uh, if we compare that with the Tigran diaspora, um, uh, to give credit to, to the Tigran community, that there is a lack of organization and speaking with the same voice and forging a common agenda. And if, if you have any uh, comment on that. Uh, so number wise, the people who, repre who are represented in the American political seen as a diaspora, Aramara, Oromo, Tigre, Somali. Uh, I would say number-wise, because Somalis, when it comes to politics, sometimes they don't have borders. If you really talk big blocks, the largest numbers would be Somali, Amara, Oromo. But the most effective group would be Tigre because of what had happened. You're right. They have, they have one center and one vision and one message that's it they even keep the dirty linen to be washed in public i give them the credit with the somalis they are nonchalant uh, it's only very small number of people who run around because uh, for a somali there are a lot of internal divisions uh, that works against them. For the Oromo, they are divided in the sense that there is a huge number of Oromo in the diaspora who still feel that Abi is one of their own, both home and here. But there is a contingency that's really working very hard. With the Amara, they have the know-how, the muscle, the money, and all that. But I think they, they're, they're lobbying uh, as my colleague earlier said, when Fano was with the government, a lot of the diaspora were supporting uh, the Abiy's um, mach killing machine. And now they walk up to that, but I think they need a couple of things to really take care of in order to, to have um, a successful campaign around. One, they need to convince um, the the political groups that they meet in their congressional state department, that FANO will have a structure and one unified political group. Because they, as Adam said, out there that you know bad boy picture is already there. So they need to do something about that. Number two, they need to suspend some of the divisive issues that rotate around the issue of uh, uh, 
regional autonomous constitutional Article 39 thing. That may take its own toll in the long haul, whether Ethiopia will revisit the constitution, which I would assume a lot of the ethnic group is like, versus the Amara elite, which may not like the way the constitution is. I would not put that on the table right now as a priority. They need to suspend that discussion and wait till we go over the hump of this autocratic nature. And then, because if you're, and you're a, a lawyer, if you're thinking of constitution, it's a living document. And I heard you saying that many times. It's a living document. If one part of it doesn't agree to your vision, you shouldn't talk, think about today or tomorrow, but you have to think of the hundred years that this thing will be used by the Ethiopians and where are the points of interest that unites people and where are the points of interest that you like to work. That would be another discussion probably we'll have some other time. But the very fact, and this is really what makes me uh, kind of optimistic, the very fact that the congressional member is raised issues, and I'm reading what they raised, issues that come from Somali community, from Oromo community, from Amara community, from Tigray community. For the first time, the four seems to have put their mark on this hearing. We like to meet to, again one more time, bring these people together like we did in San Diego, either in Washington or somewhere, iron out some of the issues, suspend the little issues, and then come to the big picture to say what's a priority and then work on that. I think if we work on that, there may be some hope to really move forward and uh, put a check on, on the mayhem that could befell on Oromo, Oromo and Amara. Because what Abi has in store, for the Amara is not an easy thing. He already done to the Oromo, he's doing to the Amara. But when he bosses to say that his uh, capital uh, pocket is about $10 billion and he, if he need be, he will buy and use all that money for, for weapons. That is not an optimistic uh, look that we see in the future. Hmm. Uh, well, okay, one point before I bring up, there is a question from our audience, just one specific question. Uh, but before that, I really want to add on this foreign policy framework. Do you think that um, morality and uh, the power of truth matters as much as the way, the way you present your case in, in American uh, diplomacy? Because people think that, okay, I have a, a bunch of truths and then, then the world has to uh, support my cause out of morality. Um, do you think that should be a priority or... Yes. Well, that's a good question. Yeah, that you have well, to really speak to the American foreign policy principle. So Washington is is an animal town. It has many constituents. It has the State Department and the Army, the military. It has the members of the Congress who are elected every two years and the senators. It has also an entire group of people who live off of the State Department is largesse as consultants, as activists, as human rights groups. The biggest division that you see in Washington is political landscape is between people who really care about third world countries, whether they are, uh, you know, humanitarian groups, development, pro-development groups, uh, women agenda groups. You have those groups who are really genuine. I'm not talking about individual, but I'm talking about the collective. Those people spend their entire career to save one life and to bring some change to the life of the peasant and the mother and the small person. Then there is this huge constituency that opposes them that does big contracts with the military Pentagon and the State Department that also influences the State Department. For instance, Moses, I'll tell you, when the Israeli-Gaza-Palestinian issue took place and, and that whole fiasco, some of the uh, journalists softened their languages when they questioned congressional members or politicians. And, you know, simply because that Congress member will not say anything to, to them at that particular time, but he can literally pick up the phone and call the CEO and say, Mogus was asking me the toughest question in two, three days, that person could be fired. So there is this struggle, the same struggle we have, that struggle is also in Washington. Who are our allies? Definitely those groups that I say.
probably not 100% all the time, but like the amnesty, like the human rights groups, like the development uh, constituencies, like lawyers without borders, you know, doctors without, those are the groups that are always knocking on the door saying people are dying in Ethiopia and we need to develop relation with that. And then some of the progressive with the US congressional, the group that you saw yesterday, are some of the progressive groups that we need to have in contact. But I, again, there is always that group that doesn't want to work with us, and we have to know that. Yeah. All right. So this is uh, one question from our audience. Uh, I think you have already, um, around the beginning, in your opening statement, you have uh, said something, but he Dawit wanted that in his first remark, he alluded his concern about Abiy war rhetoric about the port access by all means. So, Mr. Faisal, what is your thought about American Congress, Congress's new view towards this issue? Yeah. They are extremely, extremely worried. It was a shock to the world and to everybody. Entire Western journalists wrote about this. I have an upcoming article tomorrow on uh, wardernews.com that I'm talking about the whole Red Sea fiasco. And there was an article somebody wrote that I'm quoting that literally said that was tantamount to declaring almost a war in the region by Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed. And then other writers compared what Abiy did to what Russia and China did to capture their small neighbors and, and the war in Ukraine and all that. So people are taking very seriously. Believe me, when we are watching, what we are watching is the tip of the iceberg. The US Congress members have internal intelligence reports that will really tell them who what Abiy is, how he is prepared, what he meant. That is analyzed by top-notch uh, CIA and military strategists. So they have, when they ask that kind of question, they could not help it, but put out that to the American public and their, and their constituency. So if they later on, when they go to their districts, if anybody asks them, why do you oppose this man? Or why are you grilling the Ethiopian government? They want to tell that this man is a warmonger. They, for them to bring that issue to the table, they see Abiy as a dangerous man. From now on, Mogus, my opinion is the United States of America is in a containment period. They're containing this man so that he doesn't explode. If they let him, he could explode. They have seen what he has done in Tikrai. They have seen what he has done in Oromia. And they have seen what he is doing in Amara, a group that were his core supporters not too long ago. If that is not madness, if that doesn't bring any fear to people who are sitting in the comfort of that Washington, D.C., I don't know what else. So they are very afraid that Abiy is the devil that finally descended to the Horn of Africa to really completely create an unheard fiasco. And they want to do whatever they can do. And behind the scene, this conversation, if I call this a terrifying hearing, behind the scene, it's worse. Mm. Um, if, even though the ambassador... Uh, or the special envoy was uh, kind of soft, soft-hearted, or is it that he was deliberately using uh, a, a, a constructive uh, ambiguity, uh, or is he somehow defending Abi, or why, why is he not pleased with Zorik is the table, and then he's also concerned because I didn't hear as much from the ambassador as the uh, uh, yes. the chair was alluding in, in that in that uh, theory. Ambassador Hammer is a very intelligent and uh, well seasoned diplomat. He even mentioned it to the members. He said when Abi raised, you know, unilaterally capturing Red Sea or gaining it, he said I referred him to the Chile and Bolivia case which is very interesting, a case that went all the way to the international court that, you know, gave uh, Chile everything and said, you know, Bolivia doesn't have any right to take or even 
uh, have access to the Chilean Sea unless Chile permits. Basically, he, what he was saying was this guy doesn't know. I even gave him my own experience that there are other ways and what he is trying is out of the books. I think I think he was embarrassed, uh, my camera, to, uh, he was caught in between hard place and rock that he knows what Abi said he knows what Abi is doing. He's shocked even himself when he heard that. But at the same time, as a diplomat, he has to say, but again, also a few days after Abi said this and that, which is on the books, but basically nobody denied. Abi said what he said. Nobody denied. Abi said, if we don't get the access, we will be eating other people or we are prison of, uh, you know, 120 million people. That is out of the genie. Now people can interpret, but there is no way that Mike was uh, justifying Abiz or hiding. He was just diplomatically saying, this man is a tough dude to work with and America is trying to handle him. All right. Yeah, that's great. Maybe he's saying that diplomatically and in a very legal terms, uh, doing so would be an absolute madness. The fact, the fact that he mentioned the case of Chile and Bolivia, he was saying doing otherwise would be uh, taking a very dangerous route. I think that, that, that is what he was implying in a diplomatic yes, yes. way. So yes. um, with that, um, from here, where are we supposed to go? What would you expect in, in, in the near future? Um, possibly, as you said, before the upcoming election, but I do not go as far as upcoming election. You can, you can, make, uh, yes. you can, you can add that issue, but generally, uh, what would be a takeaway from our today's discussion, um, as well as uh, the congressional hearing? And what shall every stakeholder supposed to do in this regard? The takeaway for me is that the U.S. government, through the State Department, gave Prime Minister Abiy and his team one concession. That concession is the transitional chess. It looks like the United States government will not press Addis Ababa to carry a full-blown uh, bottom-up uh, people-centered, as they had people-centered the transitional justice. I think Washington is already funding and spending enough money to work with the government of Prime Minister Abiy, administration of Prime Minister Abiy, to work with the national dialogue. And as you know, most the national dialogue has already started and coming to the United States very soon. I hope I hope the Ethiopians, particularly the Amara diaspora, doesn't uh, by court. I hope they participate and challenge and put them on the spot and make sure that this by people don't get easy. See, they come here and they want a checkbox and they say, we went to San Diego, we went to Colorado, we went to Washington, D.C., and then close the books. I think even if it has to grill them and go to the hearing, I will encourage every Ethiopian who is in a town where the hearing is taking place, to be there. I filled the form, submitted my name, not because I want to hear this guy's uh, window dressing, but I want to make sure that they don't get an easy time in terms of, you know, that's one. Secondly, as I said, they need to lobby for more hearing between now and November, and they make sure that Ethiopians come together on the issue and suspend some of the minor divisive issues and look at the big picture, which is to seek some, America will never change will never change a regime. But America will help its diaspora who are tax paying to use the tools and the toolboxes that it has to pressure the government to relent and make change. And I think that's the only way they can work. If Abi is, uh, uh, you know, anybody who is listening to the US Congress yesterday, he should be prepared to make some change. If he doesn't, I think they will pressure him very much. They will use World Bank and IMF as Congressman Sherman suggested. And we wanna make sure that people go back to their members to ensure that more hearing is held. And we wanna thank them very much as to the hearing that they held, which was in my opinion, very effective. Um, thank you very much, uh, Faisal. As always, it is my pleasure. It is um, always um, great to listen to your lecture and um, you did dissecting the issue of diplomacy, especially American foreign policy and the Ethiopian diaspora and the Horn of Africa, which is unfortunately uh, a very troubled region than, than, than ever. Um, for today, uh, we shall um, uh, end with this remark. Uh, I hope this is not the last time we are going to discuss on this issue. 
I would like also to especially thank you for organizing the community all the way from California to Minnesota and to Washington, D.C. Many people have no idea how this hearing came about. And most, most people think that as if it, it was out of the blue. No, it wasn't. It was because of, it was the fruit of a hard labor of people like you and other diaspora member. So I thank you. I thank you all of those people who are concerned about the stability, prosperity, and equality and the justice of the Ethiopian people. So thank you very much. Um, thank hello, you, everybody. Mr. Thank you, um, I appreciate it. All right, have a good day. Thank you. So ladies and gentlemen, this was our, the third um, episode of our special podcast on Ethiopia today. And in our today's discussion, we have discussed about the state of diplomacy between Ethiopia and the United States, as informed by yesterday's congressional hearing. Our today's guests were um, Mr. Faisal Roble, our regular uh, political commentator and a well-seasoned politician. And Dr. Adam Abebe is an expert on constitutional law, and he's also a regular commentator on the Ethiopian politics and the legal issues. With that, uh, we shall end our discussion for today here. I will see you soon, possibly in the coming uh, two weeks. Thank you very much for being with us. Have a good day. Have a good night. Ciao until next time. የሐሳብ ገበታ ሐሳብ ያለልዩነት ዛናዊነት እንደሆነ በአሳታፊነት የሚንሸራሸርበት ቤት በሐሳብ ገበታችን ወቅታዊ ማህበራዊ ፖለቲካዊ እንዲሁም የህግ ጉዳዮች በስፋት በጥልቀትና በአካታችነት ይቀርባሉ የሳምንቱ ግዳም የሳምንቱ ተጋባጅ ማህበረሰብ አንቀጽ ፖለቲከኞች እንዲሁም ሞያተኞች የሚቀርቡበት ፕሮግራም ወቅታዊ ጉዳይ ታዋቂ ጉዳዮች የሚዳሰሱ በዝግጅት የውይይትና የክርክር መድረክ ለያየ ጉራይ የሚገኙ ታላላቅ ፖለቲከኞች የማህበረሰብ አንቀጽ እንዲሁም ሞያተኞች በሐሳብ ዙሪያ ፊት ለፊት የሚወያዩበት ከዛ ማልፎ የሚሟገቱበት ፕሮግራም ህዝባዊ መድረክ ለያየ ጉዳዮች ላይ ሁሉም የሐሳብ ገበታ ቤተሰቦች በቀጥታ ሐሳባቸውን የሚያቀርቡበትና ተሳታፊ የሚሆኑበት ቤተሰቦቻችን እድል የሚሰጥበት ጊዜም ለዚህና ሌሎች ሳምንታይ ፕሮግራሞችን ለእናንተ እናቀርባለን ይሄንን እተወደደ ቻናል ሰብስክራይብ በማድረግ ቤተሰብ ይሁን በስፋት ትደራሽ ድሁም ለሌሎች ያጋሩ የሐሳብ ገበታው እንዲጥራከር በተሻለ ጥራትና ስፋት ለእናንተ እንዲደርስ በሐሳቡ ወያውና በገንዘቡ ይደግፉን የሐሳብ ገበታን በሱፐር ቻት በሱፐር ታንክስና በሱፐር ስቲከር አጋርነቱን ያሳዩ በጎፈንዲም ማራጅ የሐሳብ ገበታን ያበረታቱ ስለ ሐሳብ አስተያየት ወንድሆም ድጋፎም ናም ሰግናለን